My wife and I had an unfortunate encounter with a black bear that came into our house. Oh, this is an interesting one. <laughs> and I've never heard of a grizzly attacking anyone backwards. <laughs> Don't make that mistake because bears can run really, really fast. The whole point is there a lot of a debate about pepper spray. But I would say this, Trying to use bear spray as a first resort and then backing it up with a firearm, I don't think it's a good idea. I felt a bear's breath on the back of my neck. Getting down on your knees when a bear charges you, I thought at first, like, who's gonna have the presence of mind to go to one knee? Bears, bears, bears. It seems we can't get enough of bears. And it being spring and bear season, well, with the hiking and camping season coming right up, there are a lot of people uh, worried about bears because they're going to be out in bear country. So uh, we thought we would do a lot of things about bears in the next month or so, including this podcast in which we answer some, some basic questions about what is good bear protection. And that includes just about anything that would keep you safe from a, uh, hmm, shall we say, prospecting bear. <laughs> So we are going to read a few comments from you good folks that you have sent in in response to some of the videos that we have already done on bear protection handguns, best bear hunting rifles, best cartridges, and all that sort of stuff. So one of the first questions we obviously have to ask is, are bear attacks really a concern? I mean, how many people get attacked by bears? Well, it's not a huge number. I did some research and I came up with somewhere between 67 and 85 people in the U.S. of A. Well, we'll make that Canada as well. So say North America have been killed by bears, polar bears, brown bears, grizzly bears, black bears. The greatest number of them, by golly, were from black bears. And usually you think, yes, yeah, just a black bear. But what uh, science has pretty much shown and what incidents have proven is that black bears are more abundant and more widespread than the others. And that's a big reason why there's not as a percentage basis as many attacks from black bears, but there's just a lot more of them in settled areas. So we're quite frequently coming in contact with them. But unlike grizzly bears, they don't really attack so much out of anger as out of predation. And that makes it even scarier. It seems like when, when a black bear attacks, it's thinking it's dinner time and you're the main course. So do you have to be concerned about black bears? I have throughout my career in the outdoors not been too concerned about them, even the ones that were literally sticking their noses in the tent. But maybe I should have been. It might just behoove all of us to be prepared to handle black bears as well as the others. Now, the deadliest bear out there is supposed to be the polar bear because they are strictly carnivores. They don't eat roots and berries and things. They just eat meat. Mostly it's seal meat, whale meat, anything up in the Arctic, obviously. And when people go into the Arctic, that's meat. <laughs> so if a polar bear is coming after you, it is coming after you like the black bear to eat only its three, four times bigger than the black bear. So you really have to be worried. But how many of us are going into the polar wastes where we're likely to bump into a polar bear? So I don't think we need to get too freaked out about that. I would lump them in the same category as brown bears because of the weight similarity. Uh, not worry too much about the aggression. Um, if you can handle a brown bear that's weighing a thousand pounds or more, you can handle a polar bear, I would think. And then that leaves us with grizzlies, which are the notorious angry grizzly bears that really seem to be at the heart of attacks on people in the Rocky Mountain West, as well as up into Canada and into Alaska. And it seems like they're just a little more cranky and irascible. And if they're going to attack you, it will be because you've gotten between them and their food source, perhaps, or between them and their cubs. But there are plenty of incidents, I think, of grizzlies trying to feed on people and brown bears as well. Uh, they've killed a few folks within the last 20, 25 years and fed on them before the carcasses were recovered, shall we say. But it hardly matters whether the bear's after you because you ticked it off or it wants to eat you, you are still in trouble if you cannot defend yourself from a bear. So how are we going to do that? Before we get to that part, let's hear from someone called Bearded Beast Man, who writes this. My wife and I had an unfortunate encounter with a black bear that came into our house. 
I ended up fighting with that bear while my wife grabbed a kitchen knife. She stabbed the bear, which got it off of me. And then I was able to receive, get this, retrieve my nine millimeter handgun and shoot and kill the bear. <laughs> so if uh, a common statement about bears is you've got to have a really big magnum handgun to handle it. And we're going to dive into some of that stuff on this episode. But here's an example of a nine millimeter, pretty puny little cartridge handling at least a black bear. So even if you're not going out into the wilderness where bears are likely to be found, you might just need some bear protection right in your house. And here is another one from Brad Smoot. My father-in-law was killed in Montana in 2001 by a bear. He had killed an elk and he was beginning to field dress that elk when he leaned his rifle against a tree just 12 steps away and the bear attacked him. Make sure when you carry, you always keep your rifle on your person and accessible. And that's a good point we're going to deal with a little bit later as well. So, I think we can figure that the black bear is probably the one we're going to bump into the most often, so we should be prepared for that. But if you're going up into the Rocky Mountain northern wilderness, into Canada, Alaska, brown bear country, grizzly bear country, you do want to be prepared for that. When do most bear attacks occur? Well, obviously when the bears are awake and prospecting. It starts kind of in April when they come out of hibernation. It really picks up over the summer because a lot of people are out in bear country doing their camping, fishing, hiking, and whatnot. But also because later in the summer, food starts to run out. You see this, hear this quite often in drought years. There just aren't enough berries and natural foods and the bears start prowling into campgrounds, getting into backyard garbage pails and whatnot. And I think they're a little hungrier, a little more irascible and the accounts go up. So August seems to be the peak month. July is right there with it. it. Starts to taper off a little bit into September and then by October, November, probably fewer people in the woods and less activity and those bears are getting ready for hibernation and I suspect by then they're finding enough oh, say hunter kills gut piles and whatnot to tie them over to help them out it, it declines at that point and of course in winter they're largely hibernating so what our best bear defense tools are well we can consider number one don't leave your house Although bearded man, beast man's proved that that's not necessarily a, a complete solution. Number two would be running shoes. And this is a standard joke. As long as you can outrun your partner, you might make it. Don't make that mistake because bears can run really, really fast. Number three, a spear or a big knife. This is partly facetious, but not necessarily. A lot of folks do recommend a really big knife. And big knives have been used more than once to fend off a bear attack but you usually get pretty cut up yourself in doing that. Then there's pepper spray. Oh boy, is there a lot of a debate about pepper spray. Some people love it, some people hate it. We're gonna dive into that. Um, number five uh, is really an important one. I might've even moved it higher up the list, but it's common sense. Be bear aware. And that has worked for me all these years. I started backpacking in bear country in 1976. Camping, fishing, hiking, photography, just sleeping out for a week at a crack in backpack tents and everything else. And I've been never attacked by a bear. Had them in a camp a few times. But if you play by the rules, which is don't eat in your tent, don't cook right beside your tent, don't attract the bears with food odors, hang your food up in a, a bag high in a tree, far away from your camp so the bears can't get in and all the rest of that. Just play by those rules and you can generally stay out of the way of bears. Making noise while you're hiking. This is not my favorite tactic because I like to be a little bit sneaky so I'm not scaring everything else away. But in bear country, especially if I see sign, which would be tracks in the trail or dung, I'm alert watching for bears and I start to make some noise so that they can hear me coming well ahead of time. You don't want to sneak up on a bear or inadvertently or on purpose and then suddenly startle it with a noise. That might elicit an attack. But if you can make enough noise as you're going so they can hear you from yards away, if not hundreds of yards away, and just move out of your way, you're probably going to be better off. So there's plenty of rules and regulations and ideas and suggestions on how to be bear aware and keep yourself safe. And they seem to work pretty darn well. And, and as far as I'm concerned, whether I have the best defensive tools at hand or not, I just as soon not have to defend myself against a bear at all. <laughs> so that's a good one. 
Then there's number six. It's often recommended as the ultimate ideal, the shotgun. We're going to see if that's really true or not. And then the rifle and finally a handgun. And there are plenty of people who say you just cannot defend yourself against a bear attack by using a handgun. But others say it's the ideal tool to use. So let's dive in. First of all, stay at home. So what's the fun in that? <laughs> but many people have written in to say, so-and-so got attacked by a bear. Tough luck. You invaded his territory. I get it. I probably said the same myself a few times, but really we need to think about this. If you're saying that someone who's up fishing or hiking or camping in the Rocky Mountains or Canada and Alaska, that's bear country for sure. Are you saying they've got no business to be there because that's bear habitat? By an extension of that, then we should clean out San Francisco, Sacramento, <laughs> Portland, Oregon, all the cities and pounds of places we live in that used to be grizzly bear habitat. We're just as responsible for being in their ter territories there, but because we've wiped them all out in those districts, now we can proudly say we don't interfere with the bear's habitat but we truly do. So that's a little bit of a silly argument to say you should stay out. Now, it does have validity in some protected areas and national parks. I mean, we just can't run roughshod over all of our wilderness areas and demand that it all be for us and us alone. We are entering wildlife sanctuary. So we do have to take responsibility for that. And some people honestly do go out with no kind of protection in the attitude of, well, I'm trespassing on their territory, and if they decide to take exception with that, I'll just pay the price. Well, more power to you, but <laughs> good old Grandpa Ron here tends to want to defend himself. So I think we're going to continue with the defending yourself idea. Now, what about these running shoes? Well, that's a largely a joke and absolutely a joke because bears can run, they say, 35 to maybe even 40 miles an hour. They can out run a thoroughbred racehorse over a hundred yard course. You don't stand a chance. <laughs> don't run. The better plan has always been recommended to make yourself and or your party large. And Mark Kaiser and I did this with our guide up in Alaska once on a sheep hunt. Uh, a mother grizzly was coming at us with, I can't remember now if there were two or three cubs. I think it was just two, but oh my gosh, they were the cubs of the year, and that's the absolute worst because uh, those mother bears are really protective of those little things. And of course, they were wonderfully cute and all the rest of it, but they were coming right at us as we were coming right at them. Fortunately, we were on horses, so we had a bit better chance than if we'd have been on foot. Uh, but it also helped us out because these horses were big. So all three of us were reined up together there with that bear out front and yelling at the bear. I don't believe I was using two hands. I kept one on the reins for some more control unless I needed it. But we were waving with one arm and yelling at the bear. And she stood up and the cubs stood up. What a picture. I didn't take it. <laughs> I wasn't going to go fishing for a camera right then. I was mostly hoping that she would decide to leave. And she did. She spun around after watching us for a bit and ran across a little creek and up a hill with those little cubs. And they just kept it going right on up and out of there. So making yourself big can really make a difference. Yes, that sow is going to protect if she has to, but if she's got an option and she says, that's a looking like a big bunch of trouble out there, I think I'll just go away. It's probably going to work. All right. Now, here's a, a letter from Smokey. He says, hey, I'm a 30-year Forest Service employee in Idaho. And back in the day when we were trained, well, if you were working in the field in Alaska, you had to train to shoot a 375 H and H rifle and carry it with you. Wow. No field work was allowed if you didn't qualify. I didn't know that. The public who come to Idaho and to the big national parks in Wyoming and Montana have no clue about the dangers of these big animals. I was told in a training session that a full-grown grizzly can outrun a thoroughbred horse in the first 100 yards. But in 2023, people are still coming out here hiking with Tinkerbells and bear spray. I see a hiker got killed in Glacier recently. And boy, Glacier National Park up in northern Montana is kind of a hotbed. I think that's the one when I did some research had the most attacks and kills by grizzly bears. So if you're heading up there, really be cautious on that one. All right. Now, what about a spear or a knife for defense? 
I don't think this is a good option because to be effective, you got to think of the size of a bear. You need a really big knife. Like, this is a knife. <laughs> that size of a knife. A spear, essentially. But who wants to carry that? It's one thing to strap a big honking Bowie knife on your hip and walk around it for a few days. But backpacking or camping and having that big, heavy, long thing on you all the time, I think after a while, you would tend to just, eh, I think I'll leave it in the tent today. And then you're unarmed. And certainly not going to carry a spear around, not when you're backpacking. Well, I don't know, maybe you would. You could use it as a walking stick, perhaps. But you're going to want a big, long blade on there to reach the vitals on a bear. But even if you had the perfect blade, the longest blade, and you, and you stuck it in the right place, hemorrhaging takes a while to work, guys. That bear can do some significant hemorrhaging on you <laughs> before you finish him off. So I just don't think the stabbing thing is anything but a last-ditch thing. And in that case, I don't know that a, perhaps a three- to four-inch knife, sheath knife, might work. There have been some stories for guys who, in the last effort, managed to do it under the bear getting all torn up, and they fought back with that knife, and it could work. But, boy, I sure wouldn't figure on that being my first line of defense. All right, now let's get to the, the one that really raises issues, pepper spray, bear spray. It's commonly called capsaicin, really heavy doses. And this stuff is way more powerful than the pepper spray that's used in the cities, urban dwellers and whatnot for mace-type defense. This is powerful stuff that's been proven to turn bears. I mean, it really burns their nose and their eyes and such. And, oh, the trouble is you get all these, yeah, it works complaints, and yeah, it doesn't work complaints. I don't know if we can straighten it out, but let's try. We're going to read some, some of the uh, commenters you've written in. This is William. He says, I've lived in Alaska for 33 years and worked as a paramedic. Part of my duties was bear watching and bear hazing. I noticed that you said not many bear attacks occur in Alaska, but there's quite a few that don't make the news anymore. I've had... Two of my neighbors attacked by grizzlies and a co-worker as a flight medic had two patients who were badly mauled by brown bears. And I heard or read numerous accounts of people that used pepper spray during a bear attack and not one case did it have any effect on the bear. Now, William's statement here counters what I've read when I was researching. And what makes you wonder is what's the source? Generally, it's the I don't know if I want to say anti-gun, but certainly pro-bear and anti-let's let's not shoot the bear. Let's try to not harm the bears. And I obviously, I can understand that. We don't want to be out killing animals when we don't have to. Um, but those are the ones who usually say bear spray is the absolute best thing to use. And maybe it is. We're going to look at some statistics here. But we just don't know when people write in like this, do they have an agenda? Are they biased on one side or another? Most of us are. I would recommend that all of us do our own research and try to come up with some answers here. Because when I did this, kind of vacillating. Sometimes it sounds like this bear spray is pretty darn good tool. And other times it sounds like, well, maybe it's not. And I just don't know if I can lock down the absolute correct answer for you. Let's hear from James. I know the story you're talking about. Oh, he's responding to a story that Joseph Von Benedict told about a Montanan who was uh, mauled and killed by a grizzly bear. And I think it was during an elk hunt. So James says, I know that story you're talking about. It happened fairly recently, and it was sick. Furthermore, I heard that the bear spray can was found, and it was fully used. Hmm. Additionally, a couple and their dog were killed recently in Montana by a brown bear, and uh, it took help a day later to get there to rescue them, but by then they'd passed away. And there were two cans of bear spray that were fully used up lying there. Wow. They had failed. Bear spray is being overhyped, and I feel it could result in a lawsuit if this continues. Sure, use bear spray as a first resort, but back it up with a firearm. Now, whether that's accurate or not, I don't know, but it makes you think. But I would say this, trying to use bear spray as a first resort and then backing it up with a firearm, I don't think is a good idea. And here's why. Generally, these bear attacks happen just like that. And I remember an incident where a guy was aware that the bear was coming toward him, had time to pull out his bear spray, reportedly sprayed it right into the face of the bear, and that charging bear went right through it and still mauled him. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the way I remember that story. 
But the problem I have with, let's try the bear spray, and then if that didn't work, let's go for the handgun, you're not going to get the chance. Remember how fast these things run. They're just on you like that. And given the adrenaline rush and fumbling for it and all, it's difficult to, to just use one thing, let alone two. And I think if you, you think you're going to use two, it's just going to mess you up. And you're not going to get either one of them used effectively. So I think we have to probably roll with one or the other. Now, one nice option is to have one member of the party with a handgun and the other one with the spray. That gives you two good chances, I think. All right, now let's hear from Tristan. Oh, this is an interesting one. <laughs> I felt a bear's breath on the back of my neck. I spun around and I was nose to nose with a huge grizzly and he was only inches away. I don't know how much hyperbole is in this one, but I imagine if you turned around and a bear was right there, whether he was feet away, yards away, or inches away, it probably looked and felt like inches. At <laughs> any rate, Tristan says, he wasn't hostile at all. He was only curious about this new thing in his world. Being insanely curious, as bears are, he had circled around to check me out. I panicked, and I shot that spray right up his nose from two inches away. He screamed, and he did a backflip, and he ran off screaming till I couldn't hear him anymore. He was ru running with his nose burnt, and he was blinded and snapping off four-inch pines like they were toothpicks. That bear never came back into our area ever again. If he'd have been uh, out to get me, he'd have just swatted my head off, no problem. I'll bet if he ever sensed another human anywhere near, he'd run off like a scalded cat. Other than that, I've never heard of bear spray working as advertised. So there's another opinion. Now, here's another thing you need to consider about bear spray. I don't think they let you fly with it on commercial air flights. I always see there's that can of bear spray with an X in it. Can't take it. Um, maybe I heard some rumors that you can check it in baggage, but I doubt it because that's still in the plane and that stuff is so powerful that can burst or something. So I don't think it can fly. That means you go up to Anchorage or up to somewhere in uh, British Columbia, you can't fly your bear spray up there. And a lot of these smaller places you get to, you can't buy it. And it's really expensive. Gosh, I think the last can of it I bought was a good 20 years ago and it was $50 already. I haven't looked what they are lately, but it just sits here because I generally fly to the places where the bear problem and I can't bring it with me. Now, I'll carry it here in Idaho, Montana, any place that I drive to, but it's a consideration. Now, here's somebody from Alaska or got some experience, at least up in Alaska. His name is Rodaman, and he said, hey, bush pilots who transport hunters usually have a pile of bear spray canisters and they'll let you pick from them. They carry bear spray in the plane floats rather than keeping it inside. Now, I had not heard of that, but it makes perfect sense. So if someone's up there on a hunt and they buy the can of bear spray in Anchorage or Fairbanks or someplace, and then they're coming home, they can't fly at home, they have to leave it behind, donate it to the uh, bush pilot. And then he ends up with a stack of them. He might as well supply those to his new clients. So that might work for you. All right. Now we talked about common sense and be bear aware. And again, Go to the Forest Service. Um, these government agencies usually have signs posted out front in hiking trails and stuff in the West, and they give good advice about just how to be aware of a bear and uh, defend yourself by just not getting in trouble in the first place. Quick little story about bear aware. They were doing research up in Denali Park in Alaska back in the 90s. Maybe it was the late 80s, but somewhere in there. And these, uh, I, I suppose they were graduate students or something. They wanted to test a new container for campers that would, you could put your food in and the bears couldn't break into it. So they put these canisters out, uh, but the bears were eating berries and they didn't even pay any attention to them. So they smeared bacon all over the outside of them and set those out, figuring the bears would come up and, and test them. They wouldn't even find them with the, with the bacon grease on them, which makes you go, what? Why do they keep coming into camp to steal our food if we put bacon right out there in their territory and we watch them feed on berries around that thing and they wouldn't go for it? And I literally watched this happen. I asked this, I think it was a young lady doing the research, what's going on out there with that bear? She's trying to get him to try to open that canister and he won't go over there. We've got bacon on it and he won't even get it. So just a funny little bear story from the archives. 
Now, shotguns. These are often recommended, especially at 12 gauge with slugs, as the ultimate bear defense gun, pump action especially. I question that partly because of the power level of a 12 gauge. You don't have a lot of pressure driving those slugs. There's not a lot of powder in there, so they're not going all that fast. 1,200 feet per second. And the slugs aren't usually, well, they're not all that hard. It's usually just a lead slug and they flatten out. And they don't, and they're not really long, so they don't have a high sectional density for deep penetration. And I think that's the issue. And you can see some of it in a video that we'll have up here soon, if it's not already up, in which Joseph Von Benedict and I shot into some maple logs with different bullets and different cartridges, including a, a 12 gauge with slug and a couple of slugs. One was a traditional lead slug, but it was a uh, Sabo setup, so it was not a full diameter, so it actually had a higher sectional density and higher velocity and still got minimal uh, penetration. You can check that video out and see what went on there. The other one was 485 grain steel slug. I mean, it was steel, hard, right into a maple log, and it emerged almost perfect condition, but it didn't penetrate all that much. I think that's an issue with trying to use a 12 gauge. But do some more research on your own to find out how many times 12 gauge guns have been used successfully to deter bears, stop bears, kill bears, or whatever is required to keep you safe. Cubby's coming around here. Cubby, what is going on? <laughs> She's going crazy. You're trying to lure me outside, aren't you? Come here. Come here and say hi to everybody. Come on up here. Hey there. Look at that. Now there's bear protection for you. And that brings up another topic dogs. So often people will say, boy, don't take a dog out into bear country with you because they are trouble. They will attract the bear. But I've done some research on that one and it says that's not true either. Uh, oftentimes the dog can help deter the bear uh, or lead him away from you or the bear will concentrate on the dog and free you up. Of course, if you love your dog, you might not want the bear to get your dog either. So, and again, I'm just giving you ideas here. I'm not saying I'm the expert on all this stuff, but I tend to not take Covey along when I'm hiking in grizzly bear country. I'm not too worried about brown or black bears, but we've got grizz not too far north of here, and she's not going to be along because years ago I had a different setter, and I was out camping, staying overnight in the tent, usual stuff, early in the morning, let the dog out of the tent to do her business. She comes yiping back with a moose chasing her, and she dives into the tent. <laughs> Thank goodness the moose didn't dive into the tent. Get out of here, moose. But that was a little bit spooky. And if that had been a bear behind that dog, I think uh, the bear would have been in the tent. <laughs> okay, now where were we? Oh, shotguns. Yeah, look into that slug idea. I don't know that you can get enough penetration out of a shotgun. Now, of course, the nice thing is a pump shotgun is really quick. You can put a lot of shots downrange in a hurry. And they can be fairly short. I have one with a 24-inch barrel. I think if I were going to use it consistently for bear protection, I'd probably cut that barrel down to 20. I think the legal limit is 18. You might want to check that, too. It might go as low as 16 before you get into that sawed-off shotgun vicinity. Um, but keeping that magazine tube long so you've got more rounds in there, too, you got to keep your barrel out there far enough to keep the magazine tube long enough to hold four or five. Uh, one in the chamber, four or five in the magazine tube, and you've got quite a bit of firepower. As long as you've got a, a slug that's going to penetrate, don't try buckshot. Buckshot, a lot of people will say, oh, you know, it's buckshot. And if you've seen enough Westerns, you know how deadly that is because it just sprays on I mean, you can't miss with buckshot, right? There are not that many pellets in a load of double lot buck, and that's a 32 caliber ball. So you're shooting a puny little 32 caliber like a pistol. It's about the same power as a 30 caliber pistol at a bear and it's lead and it's round and it has lousy sectional density and it just does not penetrate a buck. I mean, you might get lucky, but I wouldn't try it with buckshot. All right. So what's the next one? Um, rifles. Now, obviously, a big, powerful rifle is going to do the job. The trouble with big, powerful rifles, now there's several problems with it. One is they're big, they're heavy, they're long. Do you want to carry it? Obviously, if you're hunting, sure. But if you're just fishing, if you're up there fly rotting and you're fighting the currents and all the things that you do, you want this big rifle hanging over your shoulder, I'm going to whack it with my fly rod. 
I just don't think it's all that practical. Um, now, if your guide is with you, sure, he can stand guard, but then you've got a specialty item there. You will not only have a gun, a rifle to protect you, but you'll have someone to manipulate the rifle while you concentrate on fishing or cooking or whatever it is you're doing outdoors. So don't just assume that some big 4570 or 458 or 375 H&H or anything like that is going to be the ticket. Now, if you're hunting in bear country and you want to select a rifle and cartridge that will also protect you from bears quite effectively, you need to strike a balance between what you need for your deer, sheep, elk, and moose for range and reach and what you need for really hitting a bear hard up close. And most of the research that I have done, including interviewing some master guides in Alaska, is that a good hard bullet that penetrates deeply is more important than the diameter or even the velocity. As long as you're launching that thing somewhere around 2,000 feet per second or a little faster, and it's good and hard, you're going to get the penetration you need. And that's what stops and or finishes the bear. There is no shoulder-fired cartridge rifle that I have found that is a literal stopping unless you hit the central nervous system. You can break some major skeletal structure, like the front legs, which is good, but you know how four-legged animals are. They can be pretty effective three-legged animals. Um, but the chest shot, sure, you'll take out the heart and the lungs, but you know how long animals can live without a heart and lung. And you've read, as I have, tales of bears being shot four, five, six, eight times with some pretty big, sizable cartridges, and they're still not stopped. You know, it'll eventually stop where they can do a lot of damage before it happens. So it, that suggests is you can have a compromise. You don't have to have a giant Magnum 45 caliber thing for your sheep hunt just because you might bump into a bear like the sow and the cubs we found up in Alaska. So you might do better off with a 338 Winchester Magnum. Or you might do just as well with a 300 Magnum or even a, a 7. So long as you use heavy for caliber bullets and a pretty darned hard one, swift A-frames, uh, some of the harder bonded bullets, um, the all copper bullets. You could even go with a solid, but I'd go with a flat-nosed solid, not a, not a uh, typical um, ogive solid bullet. You're not worried about ballistic efficiency here. You just want a bullet that goes straight. And once a bullet strikes a medium, if it has a flat front, it will continue more in a straight line. If it has a curved nose, that curved nose can get more friction on one side than the other and get deflected and come out without reaching the vital. So you want something that's going to penetrate deep, deep, deep. But the biggest problem that I have with rifles for bears is, yeah, that's fine if you're on a hunt, but boy, for fishing and camping and backpacking and all the other things you do out, including berry picking, it's just a little bit too bulky and too easy to leave behind because you just don't want to drag eight pounds worth of rifle out there. So consider that carefully before you decide that's the ultimate solution for you. Now that takes us to handguns. And this is where I and a lot of my Western friends think you're probably got your best bet. It's between this and the spray thing. So here's from Marty. Looks like he's been up in Kodiak Island. I spent a few years on Kodiak Island in the 90s, and the general sentiment at the time was that if you bought a handgun for bear defense, you should file the sights off so it doesn't hurt as bad when the bear shoves it into your nether region. So, gosh. That said, I have spent more time in bear country than most, and ideally, I think you're onto something with your suggestion of a 10 millimeter. And that's what we, uh, Joseph and I, discussed in our video on bear handguns. The 10 millimeter looks like a pretty good option. And um, Marty adds, the 10 millimeter is good if you practice often. The kind of firepower with ammo capable of modern ballistics wasn't even something we imagined back in those days when I was on Kodiak. But Freedom Arms was just starting out with their 458 Kasul, but we still didn't think that that was big enough to deter bear. Uh, so we carried rifles, but he thinks now that the 10 millimeter might be a good idea. And what's backing him up is a lot of research that's been done lately on the 10 millimeter 357 Magnum in a, in a revolver. And the, uh, of all things, the 9 millimeter. Remember our black bear in the kitchen? 9 millimeter finished it. 
Well, uh, my master guide friend in Alaska, um, Phil Shoemaker, took down a big boar, brown bear, with a nine millimeter handgun. It can be done. The trick is to have that heavy for caliber, hard bullet, hard cast lead. Buffalo boar loads a lot of that. Now we are interviewing Phil here really quickly. So you're going to be able to hear his amazing stories. He has been a master guide in Alaska, living in a cabin in the wilderness with his wife and kids for, oh gosh, it must be 40 years now. So the man has deep, deep experience with brown bears. I mean, he lives cheek to jowl with them. And he's taken hunters out. His daughter Tia is a guide, and they've got some great stories. So we're going to learn a lot about what is good and effective on brown bears. So stay tuned for that or check out our channel. It's probably up before this comes out. I'm not sure in what order we're going to turn these loose, but there'll be some really good information from Phil on this. Okay, let's see what else folks have to say here. Paleotech. Based on all documentable evidence, handguns are 98% effective at stopping bear attacks. In comparison, bear spray is about 85% effective. Ooh, well, now see, I've seen just the opposite. I read some studies and stuff, and they said that the bear spray was effective 90% of the time, but handguns were only effective about 50% of the time. And I think, I think the often, even though it was 50% effective, the they were still torn up a bit. I can't remember how that statistic went. The point is you get these conflicting studies and statistics. And this is what makes it so frustrating. You'd like to say, well, come on, give us a straight scoop. There's always these biases involved. So you just don't know what you need to believe. So this is why I'm saying you guys have to decide for yourself. Do a whole bunch of research because this could be your life on the line or your family's lives on the line. You want to be able to handle it well. And if it's true that handguns are not all that effective, maybe you're better off with the bear spray. But I think with either one, the critical thing is you've got to really know how to use this stuff. I mean, if I had my, my can of bear spray in front of me right now, I'd have to read the directions on how to fire the darn thing. It's been so long since I've used it. And the other thing is I don't use it because it's not like you reload it. With a handgun, I can run a seven, eight round magazine in and pop them off and do all kinds of shooting and put some more in. With a bear spray, <laughs> lasts about seven seconds and I got to go buy another can of expensive bear spray. So how often am I going to pull that thing out and try it? Then the other concern, of course, is the wind. Guys have had bears attacking them and the wind's coming with the bear <laughs> and they spray and now they got not only a bear attack, but a pepper spray attack <laughs> and they get incapacitated, not the bear. <laughs> So there's just all kinds of things to think about. And then there's, of course, the argument of, well, then there's Billy Bob, who's not really all that well prepared with his handgun, and he can't get it out. He can't get the safety off. He can't get a shot off, or he shoots himself in the leg as he tries to get it out. You've got to be trained. And this means extensive training, not just once in a while. Now, here was something really interesting on a bear study. This was in Ammo Land, which is a website for, obviously, ammo, guns, and hunting and stuff. But it was a, a thing done by someone named Dean Weingarten. He published this data that he'd compiled. How accurate this is, I don't know. But he said there are 123 documented cases where pistols were fired in defense against bears without assistance from other lethal means. In three of those cases, there were failures. But the success rate was 98%. 98% with a handgun. Just the opposite of what the spray people say. Once again, I don't know what to tell you guys. Now, this is Andy, Andy Hersfell, 9422. I carry a Smith & Wesson 329 PD 44 Magnum titanium in a chest rig. It has taken years of practice to master it and a good set of Hogue grips. I make a point to shoot it at least once a month. I wear it every time I go hunting and I forget I have it on. That's the kind of practice we're talking about. You've got to just, it's got to be like second nature to you. And figure out how you're going to wear that thing. It's nice to have one on your belt. You can be really good and well trained with it. And then you go backpacking, you've got a backpack belt strapped around your belt. Now you've got to transfer it to your backpack. Transfer it to your backpack. You get to camp, you take off the pack, you start working with your stove and your food, and your handgun's now on your pack. All kinds of things you have to think about. Let's see what, uh, 
Rodaman. Wasn't that just, didn't we have a Rodaman earlier? Well, we've got him again. Rodaman says, I carry a 10 millimeter model 1911. It's a thumper. It's very reliable. I like that it's flat. Several years ago, a guy in Kenai was attacked by the brown bear and he shot it with his 44 Magnum revolver. He got four shots off before the gun jammed. One of the bullets had moved forward under the heavy recoil and it pulled out of the case far enough to bind the cylinder up. Oh, I've heard about that. So if you do carry heavy loads in a revolver, make sure the crimp is really tight. See, that's another thing about know your stuff. Train, get that gun to be functioning perfectly every time. You just can't go off, shall we say, half cocked. <laughs> Now, something else about big handguns. A lot of guys will write in and say, boy, you need a, a 500 Smith & Wesson or a 460 Smith & Wesson, at least a 454 Casual. Gentlemen, ladies, can you handle it? Can you shoot it well enough to get multiple shots off without the recoil throwing you so far off? Or are you going to be afraid of the recoil and flinch and all the rest of it? You really need to know your gun. And I would rather shoot a a lightweight um, handgun with a lightweight bullet that I could shoot well without fear and have a hard, hard cast bullet that's going to penetrate like the nine millimeters that Phil used on his bear than some monstrous gun that I could not control. First time I ever went to Alaska, I took a 41 Magnum along. That's pretty close to a 44 Mag. It was a Smith & Wesson revolver. And I thought, well, now what if a bear attacks me? If you go to Alaska, there's, well, at least there used to be 50 gallon oil drums all over because they fly them out to some airstrip and then they keep their fuel in there. And eventually you've got some rusty barrels lying all over. So there's just rusty barrel and I, that's about the size of a bear. I'm going to shoot it really fast. So I started banging away with this double action revolver and 44 mag. And I was not an experienced handgunner. First shot in the barrel, second shot top edge of the barrel next shots up in the air somewhere i just recoiled right on out of there guys now obviously you can train to shoot that properly but don't just go buy a big gun and think now i've got something that'll stop a bear okay what else do we have here here's someone who taught school up there terry terry says i taught school in a native village in the yukon and i carried a 41 magnum there you go 220 grain hardcast buffalo bore bullets. I hear a lot about buffalo bore hardcast bullets. That's, uh, I think, what Phil was using in that nine millimeter of his. Back in those days, everyone had either a 44 mag or a 41 mag. The people carrying the 44 mag said that they had bought the biggest they could get. The 41 magnum people explained that the 41 traveled farther in the bearer and there was less recoil, which allowed for follow up shots with more precision. So there you go. They're thinking. Canadian guy, oh, drop to one knee. This is something else that came out of our uh, Joseph's and my video on the bear handguns. Getting down on your knees when a bear charges you. I thought at first, like, who's going to have the presence of mind to go to one knee? You know, I'm going to have all I can do to keep my feet on the ground instead of running backwards. You got to face that bear. Why do you want to waste time going to your knee? Here it is. A Canadian guide recommended drop to one knee because his reasoning was, People overshoot a charging bear, whereas a shot from the kneeling position is parallel to the ground and at the bear's level, so you're more likely to go through the bear rather than come down on top of him and have him run out from under the bullet before it gets there. Makes perfect sense. So I think that's something I'm going to be practicing here in the near future. Now, here's a guy who's con confused about the 357 Magnum because we don't mention it all that often. He says, I'm in my 60s. I've hunted most of my life, been interested in handguns. And all that time, everything I've ever heard and read is that the 357 Magnum is too small for bear protection. Uh, absolutely not for brown bears. Well, I can understand that. But now, now here's what's got me confused. In the last few years, I'm hearing all this stuff about the 10 millimeter as being the caliber for bear protection. And the 10 millimeter and 357 Magnum are very close in their ballistics. I'm sure you can see my confusion. Yeah, I certainly can. And I think what it is, is that the 10 millimeter at first was largely ignored until people started figuring out, you know, you look at the, the weight of the bullet and the velocities and you compare it with the 357 Magnum and, and they're about it's the same. The advantage the 10 millimeter has is it's chambered in auto loading handguns, whereas the 357 rimmed cartridge is in revolvers. Five, six shots in a revolver, nine upwards of 15 rounds in a uh, 
sled top auto loading 1911 or Glock style handgun. So the firepower seems to roll to the 10. But I do think you're right in that people are now ignoring the 357 because this 10 millimeter has proven so effective. Why not the 357? And I think the answer is what I said earlier. It's just limiting the numbers of shots. Now, some guys will say, and I think justifiably, you're not going to likely get off six shots anyway. It's going to be like right there, and you may be lucky to get two or three off. So does it really matter all that much? Maybe not. And then there's some arguments about the uh, reliability of autoloaders. Plenty of people think they're more than reliable enough. So you're, again, going to have to do your research and make your choices. But it's always worth considering these things. Here's another guy uh, in favor of the 9mm, Zeven. 9mm is actually a, a viable bare defense caliber. Hard cast bullets have exceptional penetration even out of the nine millimeter. And importantly, you can put a lot of rounds down range quickly. Yep. And he goes on to say that, oh, he saw that too. Vortex did a good podcast comparing nine millimeter and the 10 millimeter shooting them with hard cast bullets in the ballistic gelatin. And as I remember, they were probably within an inch or two of equal penetration with both those bullets. Now you're going to have a little heavier bullet in the 10, but you're also going to have a little more recoil. So you need to consider which one's going to work for you. Also, the weight of that handgun. You know, I've often thought, well, why not just get a big 1911 and and get some hard cast loads for that? I think Buffalo Bore offers a 255 grain bullet in it with some extra oomph added to it. Requires a stiffer spring to control the slide, but that one is supposed to have some great penetration too. So not why not just go with that? Well, then I strap my 1911 on, and after a while, I go, man, this thing's got me leaning to the right. It's a heavy piece. So you have to consider the weight of that handgun. All that stuff ties together. All right, let's see. Now, here is a list from someone called Lifted Above. He's done quite a bit of research, and he says, here's the list that he would consider. Good cartridges for bear defense. A 357 Magnum shooting 180 grain flat nose hard cast bullet. And then he's got the 45 ACP, the one I was just talking about in the 1911, the, uh, 255 grain hardcast buffalo bullet or underwood. Apparently, they have a good bullet too. A uh, good sectional density of 0.18, and it's equivalent to a 200 grain in a 10 millimeter. So you can use a 10 millimeter with a 200 grain hardcast bullet. All right, what else? Extreme penetrator underwood loads. You might want to check those out. Uh, 45 Super, not a lot of people have that handgun. That's a little bit rare, but a 45 Super is pretty powerful. 230 grain bullet or heavier for higher sectional density and extreme penetrator underwood load. And then the 460 Rowland heavy loads. <clears throat> the 460 Rowland is a 45 with a case stretched out to give it a little more powder capacity. Still shoots 45 bullets. So it's kind of like a, a Magnum 45 ACP. And then let's see what else. 454 Casual, 480 Ruger, and a 475 Line Ball. He said you can use a 460 Smith & Wesson or equivalent, but the guns get to be cinder block heavy and unwieldy. And <clears throat> I think that's a valid point. Okay, what else have we got here? Oh, well, this one is worth covering before we're done. This is from Tristan talking about bear skulls being too hard to penetrate. I've heard this a lot all my life. You shoot a bear right in the forehead and the bullet just bounces off because they're so big and thick. And that is apparently not true. Tristan says, we had a fishing game officer up here who only carried a 40 Smith & Wesson his entire career. And he face shot several attacking grizzlies with an old-fashioned uh, full metal jacketed bullet. He didn't get, oh, he did get knocked off his feet a couple of times, but he got, he was never mauled. He retired unscathed. And he laughed at the uh, big boar guys and said, if it's close enough to hurt you, it's close enough to shoot it in the face. And I've never heard of a grizzly attacking anyone backwards. <laughs> Personally, I'm going for the center mass with my 4570. This is what Tim Tristan said. I've been attacked five times in Alaska in the bush in the last 39 years. And the 4570 has always worked. Yeah, that is a popular rifle cartridge up there. And the rifle that's popular in is the Marlin lever action guide gun with an 18 inch barrel or so that's about as compact as you're going to get in a big 
big rifle like that. <clears throat> but again, I don't, I don't know that I'm going to wear that when I'm fishing. <clears throat> what else does he have to say? He adds this, handguns are only for backup when you can't get to your rifle quickly enough. You know, that's true. I never, I have never face shot any bear, and I hope I never have to, but I have point blanked a few with my handgun, and that worked out, but they were small bears. I definitely wouldn't want to try that with a big ticked off bear. And yes, I know about this Indian girl who killed the biggest grizzly ever recorded with a 22 long rifle. He pulled his own trick on him. She circled around him and shot him right between the eyes, almost straight down from on top of a big rock she crawled up on. Ten feet away, perfect brain shot, and dropped him like a brick. So bear skulls are bulletproof nonsense. I've processed lots of bears, and their skull is no thicker than ours is. We had uh, a bush lady who lived alone with only her 22 long rifle single shot rifle and she killed bears over the decades a lot of bears and she shot them all in the eye up the nose or just at the base of the ears sideways but she was a master snap shooter who never missed but these people are getting bears with a 22 so you can penetrate and that's why we keep saying hard cast bullets and if you look at the anatomy of a bear they got a pretty low head and i can see with that low skull angle your bullet could skip off if you don't come in at just the right angle. Plus, it sits so low that if you aim for the top of it, you're likely to just skim over it. And this is why they're saying face shoot them. They're supposedly right in the nose, and that goes back into the brain. Again, I haven't tried it, guys. This is just what people are saying. All right. So here are my conclusions from all the research and talking to all these people. This is what I've come up with. Correct me if I am wrong. I suggest that we choose between the bear spray and a handgun. But you've got to train with each of them a lot. It's got to be second nature. You have to know how to do it. Don't mix and match. I don't think you're going to have time to say, oh, here comes a charging bear. Should I use the spray? No, I use a handgun. No, I use the spray. A little bit late. But I do like the idea of Betsy having the spray and me having the handgun or vice versa. If you have a partner. Everyone should be prepared, and then you can mix things up, and you don't have to shoot the bear if you don't have to shoot the bear. And really, you don't want to have to shoot the bear because then it's like fishing game investigation and all that kind of stuff, but you definitely don't want the bear to shoot you. <laughs> so I'm going to easily shoot a bear at 10 feet be lit before I let him tear me up to prove that he was actually attacking me. I'm sorry. I'll work with the judge later. Okay, where legal, I would say carry a handgun. I would use an auto loader. You might prefer a revolver, but definitely heavy for caliber, hard cast bullets. And I would look into some all copper bullets too, especially those with a flat nose, flat front. So you get good straight line penetration. You're not going to get any deformation out of those. Then you need to have a fairly small and light handgun. Even a seven round magazine, subcompact kind of a thing. If you carry it, I mean, if that's what it takes in minimal size and weight for you to actually carry the darn thing, that's what you want. You don't want a full size one if you after a while go, I know I've been dragging this around for how long and I'm getting tired of it. Let's leave it in the, in the car or in the tent. Make sure that that thing is easy to access and activate. You've got to know how to run everything on it and run it quickly. And you've got to have a round in the magazine. You're not going to have time to pull it out and rack that slide. Should, it should be easy to aim or point and shoot accurately inside of 10 yards. 10 yards kind of is the do or die point. <clears throat> when a bear is coming at you, if you don't engage at 10 yards, he's probably going to have you before you can engage. So figure on that and get used to that distance. Practice at the distance. And if you can, try to get a moving target. I don't know exactly how you can set it up. I know folks who have taken a, a big ball and rolled it down a hill at the shooter. And then you shoot at that ball coming at you. That's your charging bear. See how many you can get into that ball. And if you just have a small ball, that just makes you aim a little closer, which is a good thing too. But that gives you the, the chance to aim at a moving target. And a ball could be bouncing a little bit too, and that could help you because a bear is not going to be perfectly level necessarily. So lots of things to think about here. Again, the heavy for caliber hard cast bullet. Train to react and use and deliver your hits in a split second under stress. So based on my research, not on my personal experience, guys, just my research, 
I think I will recommend a 10 millimeter or a nine millimeter auto loading handgun because they're light compact and they're most likely to be with you when they need them. I haven't decided for myself yet if I'm going to just go with the seven round magazine or the double stack 15 rounder. I'd like to think seven's more than enough given the speed of that attacking bear and it keeps things light and easily handed. Uh, that's my decision. You guys make your own decision. Now, if you enjoyed this little talk and would like more along the same lines with rifles, I think it might be worth doing a podcast on suitable rifles for bear hunting that could double as your bear protection in camp and so things like that. A lot of times we're out in our tents or in our campers on the side of the road in bear country where you could very easily have an accessible rifle. So it might be worth considering that. So if you want, we could go over some of these lightweight rifles or shorter rifles, um, the different action styles that might work well for us, as well as the cartridges, calibers, and the bullets. So I just urge you all to check out Ron Spomer Outdoors, our regular channel for more videos on bear guns. And I'm not sure what we're all going to do. We've got several things we're going to work on here. And then also our interview with Phil Shoemaker, the master guide who Use that nine millimeter against that big brown bear. That is going to be a fun story. And I'm sure he'll have a lot more bear stories to tell us besides that one. Oh, and we have a couple of videos that Joseph and I worked on in which we discussed specifically the bear rifles for hunting and or backup if you're hunting in sheep country and that kind of thing. But we took those outside and did some penetration tests. Not in bears. We couldn't get any to cooperate. <laughs> but we did some really hard maple logs that I'm using for the fire. Um, big ones, and just to see which bullets penetrated would give us a general idea of which ones are more likely to penetrate, and you will be surprised at what did or did not penetrate. So theirs are going to be out there for you too. Um, and then I've got a fun story, a Kamchatka bear hunt story for some entertainment. That is on a podcast, and that's also available on Ron Spomer Outdoors website in my blog. So go to ronspomeroutdoors.com, click on the blog, and you'll get the Kamchatka bear hunt story in there with a lot of photographs from that hunt. I just put all kinds of photos in there to tell the story of this crazy wild adventure we had in Russia, back when you could easily get in and out of there without problems we have these days for the big bears on Kamchatka. <laughs> And that means it's time for our comment of the week. And we've got to go with the humor one this time. This is uh, Tristan. This is the gentleman who turned around after feeling bear breathing out his neck and squirted his bear spray right up his nose. <laughs> I think he has saved that bear from future encounters with human beings. Too bad we can't give a squirt to each bear out there. I don't think we would have any more human bear conflicts. Thanks, Tristan, for writing in. And thanks to all the rest of you. Say, if you are interested in buying some of these exciting bells, this one, I think, what did, what did Doug call this one, honey? I think, I think Doug calls this one buckshot because he has a shotgun barrel holding the bell. <laughs> these are available on ronspomeroutdoors.com. If you've got someone who is hard to buy for, <laughs> here's something he probably doesn't have. A Freedom Bell by Doug Adams. So that is it for now, guys. Thanks for listening, and we will look forward to all of you joining us next time. Send in your comments. Let me know what you think about the ideas that I came up with for effective bear protection, and we'll see if we can share some of those with the rest of our listeners. Until next time, this is Ron Spomer. Hunt honest and shoot straight.